Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, before we get rolling today, I just wanted to give you a quick update on sponsorships with Hack the Entrepreneur. For the last year, about 14, 15 months, I've been running all my sponsorships through a third party company, like an ad agency, and things were going well, and then things slowly got out of my control, we'll say, to the point where I actually stopped being happy with it. And as of this episode, I am now completely free and running my own sponsorships. Sponsorships will change now on the show. They're going to be from companies that I fully support and endorse and usually have some sort of connection to um, definitely by using their product or else, as is the case starting today and for, for the next couple of months, there's a sponsor called Whiplash. They're a fulfillment company. I interviewed their founder, uh, former punk rocker turned brilliant, brilliant entrepreneur. And about eight or 10 months ago, I interviewed him. And we've kind of stayed in touch since then, um, hit it off a bit. And they've never sponsored a show before. So they're sponsoring Hack the Entrepreneur. So sponsors will change. I'm going to try and run one sponsor per episode now, possibly still the two spots, but just one sponsor and I won't be jumping all over. So um, yeah, let me, let me know. Give me some feedback. Uh, tell me what you think of the new spots. All right, let's do it. I want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Whiplash. Are you running an e-commerce business being crushed under holiday volumes and in over your head? Not if you were using Whiplash, modern fulfillment built to scale. As a Hack the Entrepreneur listener, you can get $100 credit when signing up today. Go to getwhiplash.com slash hack. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm your host, John Nasser, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is an author, entrepreneur, and a digger of mines. He started his first business at age 13 in his father's garage. By the time he graduated from business school at age 22, my guest was earning a full-time income from his nutrition supplement business. He has since founded ebook publishing school and has written and published over 20 books. Now, let's hack. Tom Corson Knowles. Today's sponsor of Hack the Entrepreneur is Whiplash, modern fulfillment built to ship. If you're running an e-commerce business, Whiplash is your virtual warehouse. You send your products to a Whiplash facility, and when your customers order, Whiplash sends it to them just like you would, but faster and cheaper. With warehouse facilities in Detroit, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and London, Whiplash will get your products to your customers faster, no matter where they live. Plus, Whiplash connects easily with major shopping carts like Shopify, Magento, and Bandcamp, so you can get up and running faster. Remember, if you were crushed under holiday volumes and in over your head, you wouldn't be if you were using Whiplash. Contact Whiplash now so this goes down in history as the last holiday you shipped yourself. Don't get stressed out. Get Whiplash. Go to getwhiplash.com hack right now. That's G-E-T-W-H-I-P-L-A-S-H dot com slash hack. And for being a Hack the Entrepreneur listener, you will get a $100 credit for getting started today. Go to getwhiplash.com slash hack. We're back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur. And today we have a very, very special guest. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, John. It's great to be here. Absolutely. My pleasure. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's jump into it. Tom, I know you're many, many things. You're a man who wears many hats, but today we're talking to Tom, the entrepreneur. So as an entrepreneur, Tom, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the best things that I've learned is just to, to be able to listen because people will tell you what they want, what they need, you know, where the gaps are in the market. And, you know, that's, it's been a challenge as an entrepreneur because, you know, when I first started out, you know, I had all these ideas. I was a creative person, right? And, you know, I'd come up with this business idea, this product, this service or whatever, and, and would just kind of try to launch it, try to get it out there, try to just sell lots of it. 
And it wasn't really until I started looking at business as this iterative process where, you know, you create a prototype, you launch that, you get feedback, you listen to your audience, and then you tweak and refine. And then, you know, maybe 50 iterations on the line, it turns out you're, you're selling something completely different than what you originally started with, which is kind of the definition of a startup, right? Like it's a startup business is a, is a business that hasn't really figured out their business model yet. And so they're still testing out new products, new services, new ideas to figure out what's actually going to work with the market. And I think the way that I learned to do that is just by, by you know, creating these prototypes, creating products or services, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, getting it out there, getting that feedback and re- listening really well and getting as much feedback as I possibly can from people to figure out what's right about and what's wrong about it so we can make something even better. I like it. I like it. So being able to listen and then iterating on those processes. You sound like a software creator. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just kind of like, to me, it's, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a programmer. I know like basic HTML and I'm pretty terrible at that. So I'm not, and I'm not really schooled in that train of thought, but just, just kind of my experience of like how the world works is that like everything is an iterative process. Like everything is like trial and error. I mean, you look at like scientific experiments, it's just this complicated elaborate game of trial and error to try to like weed out biases and so forth so that you can actually get good results from those trials and errors, right? Exactly. I think this is how the world works. Like, cause you can't, you know, it, we kind of fool ourselves as humans as thinking that we can predict the future, that we know what's going to work ahead of time. But the truth is no one knows what's going to work until you do it. Yeah, exactly. And like in school, we're all taught that whole scientific process and it makes sense in science. And then we go to start a business and we think that it has to be exactly right the very first time. If not, we suck and we should we should go back to having a job. Right. I don't know why we do that to ourselves, but we do all the time. So yeah, this is not how the world works in my experience. I know, exactly. So let's go back if we can, Tom, because you've you've been at this game of entrepreneurship for quite some time, but going through it, it doesn't always make sense, but looking back, it does. So there seems to be, looking back, this time in every entrepreneur's life when they've realized that they either have this calling to make this huge difference in the world or they found they simply could not work for somebody else. So can you kind of take us back to the point in your life where you discovered this about yourself and then also tell us which side of the fence you see yourself on? Yeah, so I had my first and only real job when I was like 15 or 16. I was uh, landscaping for a neighbor, essentially. And I got fired like my like one weekend because I got a sunburn and I didn't show up to work on Monday and got fired for not showing up. And after that, I was like, man, jobs kind of suck. Like, I don't I don't want to go to work in the sun with a sunburn, you know, and I didn't want to. And I was, you know, I was definitely a spoiled kid and and very entitled and and lazy. (laughs) Right. But at the same time, I had this this just kind of this inner feelings, inner knowing that, like, you know, if I have to do what someone else is going to tell me to do for the rest of my life, I'm going to be really miserable. And so that's when I started to get this idea that like, you know, jobs suck. Working for someone else was not going to fulfill my spirit and my soul. And that came, became absolutely crystal clear and really urgent for me when I went to business school because I saw my classmates going to internships on Wall Street. You know, they wanted to become investment bankers and they would work 100 hours a week on these internships. And sometimes they weren't even paid. It was crazy. And, you know, in a cubicle, like no social life, no time to take care of their health or sleep even eat a lot of times. And it just seemed to me absolutely insane. And so that's when I made the decision, like, I have to be an entrepreneur. I have to start a business immediately and I have to take control of my financial future because otherwise I'm going to be miserable. So what drove you to business school? If like, it seems like you almost had this like innately within you growing up that you were going to work for yourself and start your own business. What drives you to business school rather than just diving straight into the trenches and learning there? Yeah, it's hilarious. I was not intentional whatsoever. So I went to Indiana University and I knew I was going to go to Indiana University because two of my brothers went there and it was essentially the cheapest option in a really good school. And I knew that I had no idea what I wanted to study, but I knew that they had a really great business program as one of the top ranked ones in the country. And I knew they had a lot of scholarships for it. So I, I just, you know, when, when you fill out your college application, they tell you like you have to fit what your intended major is. And I had no idea. So I was just like, oh, I I'll fit business. Like literally it was like, there's no thought went into it whatsoever. I just like, I'll take business. And then they, they gave me a scholarship because I had really good grades in school. Um, so I essentially had a full ride. So that's why I studied business. <laughs> wow. Just literally that's it. It's like, well, I don't know. I don't want to study history. That sounds boring. Let's do business. Yeah. It was just because it was their biggest major and their biggest program. And it was just like the default immediate option. And it all works out in the end. So the ability to listen and then work iteratively. That is your one thing. Now, every blog post, every business expert talks about the 80-20 rule. You do 20% 
of the work, you get 80% of the results, you do what you're good at, and you delegate the rest. Tom, can you tell me something that you're absolutely not good at in your business? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, there's so many things. I would say one of the things is like organization. So, you know, like following up on little things, you know, scheduling tasks regularly, like for, for like, for example, I have a podcast show as well. Right. And if it was up to me to write those podcast show notes, you know, edit those audio files, like do everything every week. Like I could do it once in a while. Right. But to do it every week, consistently week after week, after week, after week work that I don't enjoy is absolutely just not possible for me. So I have to do work that I enjoy. Right. Which is a struggle as an entrepreneur because uh, consistently at least, right. I, I mean, I can do work I don't enjoy from time to time, but you know, to stay consistent with it week after week after week, I have to either learn it and delegate it or, or just, you know, just find someone else to do that essentially, because I just haven't been able to really get myself motivated to, to keep doing work that I don't enjoy essentially. Fair enough. Do you have like somebody you can delegate to an assistant or something? Yeah. I've got a couple of uh, like, what do you call it, virtual assistants or full-time assistants. Yeah. Wow. So you, you do have the ability to delegate, like, you know, that that's sort of your weakness, this organization part of it and scheduling. And so it has to be taken off your plate. And so do you struggle with that delegation and like trying to micromanage it? Or is it something you're good at? Cause you just don't like doing that stuff. Yeah. So I, I read a really great book called work the system by Sam Carpenter. And he talks all about this whole process of, you know, how do you actually create systems and structures in a business so that really anyone can come in and do the work. Right. Because if you're reliant on someone who's quote unquote like a superstar employee, you don't really have a sustainable business because that person gets sick, dies, leaves, whatever. You have this huge hole, right? It has to be filled. And no one can fill that hole because no one's going to be perfect, right? And no one's going to have that experience in that position. So, so what I've learned from that book to do is just, you know, having crystal clear job descriptions and task descriptions written out so that, you know, if I, if my VA leaves or quits or whatever, they can just hand off this paperwork that says, Hey, you know, here's how you do the podcast demo, step one, step two, step three, so forth. Right. So by having everything written out and by teaching my team to write everything out as they're learning new processes, we've created this kind of company, you know, information like this, this intellectual property where we, we have the, everything written out. So really anyone can come in in that role in that position and do the work and do it maybe not perfectly, but at least effectively to get started. And are they sort of like, do you treat them as sort of living, breathing documents that are also iterative, like everything else? Or are these? Static? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's not static. It's definitely iterative. It's definitely, you know, everything's changing and growing. I don't get too caught up in it. So like, I'm not going to like, you know, get mad at an employee uh, or, or assistant because, you know, it wasn't super clear on step three. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be anal about it. I'm just trying to get some structure in place so that everyone knows what they're doing and that there aren't these huge gaps in the business or problems in business, right? Because one of the biggest problems I've seen in business, John, in my own career and in other people, entrepreneurs' lives is that, you know, you get reliant, right, on one person or, or something, right? So if you have, like, for example, if you're a publisher and you have, like, one cover designer, right, and that cover designer goes on vacation or, you know, takes a break or stops answering emails, it's like, what do you do, right? And a great example of this is actually web designers, right? I've seen you know, so many people... They have only one web designer and if their web designer leaves or stops answering emails, like they're out of business for like weeks or months sometimes because they have no one to do that, that really important work for them. And so I try to always have redundancy in my business so that I always have multiple contractors available. So it doesn't mean I'm paying them regularly. It doesn't mean I'm working with them regularly, but I know who they are. I've built these relationships up ahead of time so that if my web designer does disappear in the middle of nowhere, I can find someone else to replace them. And I also have those, you know, standard operating procedures or SOPs, whatever you want to call them, just those written guidelines of, of here's how you do the work. I love it. I love it. So let's move to the work and the process or the like projects now, if we can. Projects is a loose term, but I would like to know what I'm assuming, but you can tell me if it's different, if it's a written process or if it's just an internal sort of gut process that you go through as like the entrepreneur behind all of this. But what is the process that you go through personally, Tom, to decide when a new project is now not only worth yours, but also your team's time, energy, and resources? That's yeah, a good question. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. I, I kind of have this creative process I've designed, I and mean, I really created it for mostly for books, but I found it applies to really everything in, in my business, at least. And essentially, the first step is you just get a whole bunch of ideas together, right? It's just this brainstorming session, right? And so when you're brainstorming, when you're coming up with ideas for projects, one of the reasons I think this is so important is to always have this like brainstorm list of potential projects, 
is because, you know, I suffer from, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs suffer from like shiny penny syndrome, right? So it's like some new project, some new idea, some new opportunity comes up and you're like, oh, I have to go, I have to go to that right now. And you kind of like put everything else you're doing aside to go chase this new opportunity. And that's not always the most effective use of your time or energy or focus. And so what I do is I always have this database in Evernote. And also I write down a, a pen and paper, just this list of all the potential projects we could do in our business, right? And so every time we get a new idea, we add it to that list. And then when it was time to start a new project, what we do is we go through that list of all potential projects and we say, okay, out of all these projects, you know, which one are we most excited about? Which one's going to add the most value to our customers' lives? And which one is going to be the most profitable potentially long-term, right? And I try to look at everything in long-term. So I don't want to do a project if it's like, oh, we're going to make a million dollars in six months, but long-term results is just going to do a million dollars in this year. It's going to be done, right? I don't want to do something short-term. I want to do something long-term. So that's one of the, one of the kind of guiding values of uh, principles in my business is everything I want to have long-term results and to be continuing to add value beyond just the short-term time period. So well, then once we've narrowed down that, you know, which project are we most excited about is going to have the most long-term value is going to be the most profitable potentially. That's when we start to figure out, okay, how would we get this done and start to kind of estimate, okay, like what, you know, what's going to go into this project. It's like, you know, basically kind of like a business plan, just a regular plan of just, you know, what would step one be? What would step two be? You know, what resources would we need, right? So do we need more capital? Do we need more employees, contractors, consultants, expert advice somehow, you know, relationships, joint venture partnerships? Like what do we need to make this project work? And then once we kind of have this little plan and I don't get too detailed in the planning process, but I just want to make sure I've kind of looked from kind of beginning to the end of that process to see what's going to be included. And of course, you know, it's just always going to be stuff that surprises you that you have no idea you can't predict ahead of time. But just going through that process kind of forces you to think about, you know, the big potential mistakes before you make them. I like it. I like it. So the brainstorming, all potential projects, what are you most excited? What's the long-term, has the most long-term results and is the most profitable? Is it a given that you just sort of, so you, therefore you just kind of skipped over it, but is it a given that this project or any project has to be within sort of the audience or marketplace that you already exist in? Not necessarily, no. It, it, you know, it's definitely a factor for sure, right? And so when we talk about profitability, you know, obviously something in my audience is going to be more profitable immediately because I have a big audience. You know, I can send an email out to my list and make a whole bunch of sales really fast, right? So, but it's not necessary, right? It's, it's not it's not necessary. So I'm still looking at opportunities in other areas, right? Like I'm I'm an investor, so I've invested in other companies and all different kinds of industries and stuff. And so you know, I've I've got a whole list of different ideas on my potential projects list that have nothing to do with you know creativity or entrepreneurship or, or writing books or anything like that. So nice. So I'm definitely open to new opportunities, but it, it's, it's absolutely a factor, right? So I think a big mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make is it's like, I don't know, someone had this great analogy, but it's like, it's like a mine, right? So you, if you've got this mine, you found this gold vein, you've got this big audience, you've got this business going. It's like, you know, why would you, you know, crawl out of that mine to go find some other mine that may never pay off when you can just keep digging, right? Just keep digging for gold. And I think, that's kind of how you become great in, in businesses because you, you just keep digging in that same mind. You keep learning and expanding your knowledge in that same area. And especially you become this expert where it's like, there's no one else who can compare to the knowledge that you have and the experience that you have and the success that your business has. It just grows over time. And I think that's something that takes long-term commitment for sure and focus. Right. So, so yeah, so that makes sense rather than digging another mine like a mile over, just dig the same one and keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and kind of becoming the expert within your field, which will in turn probably be also more profitable in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And in most cases, for sure. I mean, you look at most businesses like, you know, these billion dollar businesses, I mean, most of them didn't happen overnight, right? Like most really successful entrepreneurs, it wasn't something that just happened all of a sudden. It's like, it was a long-term process. Like Amazon took like 20 plus years, right? Like uh, Vice, Vice News is this multi-billion dollar news company today. It started like over 20 years ago. All these companies, you know, it took them years and years and often decades to get to this part, this part where you see them today and you say, oh, that entrepreneur is so successful and so amazing. But, you know, it's because they just kept digging, right? They just kept going in, the, in that same vein, essentially. And you can go kind of like sideways, like horizontally, like you can go and dig through and break through another chamber into a different industry, right? But I think if you, if you start something completely unrelated to what you're doing, you're basically starting from scratch. You're starting out as like this brand new entrepreneur again. And of course you have all the life experience and everything, but you don't have this necessarily the same awareness of, you know, who your customers are and, and what's going on in that market and all the different resources that you built as well. So when you're building a business, you have all these resources, right? You have an audience, you have fans, you have customers, 
you have databases, contacts, et cetera. And if you can't apply that to a new business, it's going to be tougher to get started. Yeah. Yeah. And I like your analogy of the mine and then also how you can dig sort of sideways and try and connect to another mine. Because like something with Vice, I mean, Vice is so like it is iterated and grown and evolved into something like completely different than what it started as. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? It's it's like it's not the same thing. And lots of there's lots of entrepreneurs like that. Like, I mean, the guy who created Slack, which is like a billion dollar company now, I believe, or really close to it created some product before that and like tried super hard and then just like got rid of it. Like, no, and moved on to Slack and now it's a huge success. So sometimes you have to dig those different things, but within the same marketplace. Right. Because then it builds off of what you've already created. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, if you've got a business and let's say you're doing a million dollars a year in revenue or 500,000 or more, whatever it is, right, for you, you know, something like Vice, right? Like Vice started out as like this magazine, right? Like this trendy, like culture magazine. And now it's this, you know, doing videos and, and journalism and all kinds of stuff and, and lots of stuff online, right? And so they've got all these different products and all these different services and all these different industries and all these different revenue revenue channels and business models now, right? But it all kind of goes around that same inner principle, which is basically just, they're just sharing content information, right? So, you know, if you're in a business now that's doing, let's say a million dollars in revenue, right? Like why not just take your existing business and test some new things within that business and expand it? Right, expand it horizontally, to expand some new areas, expand to different products and services that you've never offered before that maybe even hit an entirely different segment of the market or an entirely different market altogether. Right. It doesn't really make sense to me to to, you know, sell off the business in a lot of cases, because when you do that, it's like again, it's like you're starting from from scratch. And and unless you feel like that new opportunity is like so big that you just can't you just you have to focus hundred percent on it. Or you feel like your existing business, like you're bored of it, you don't like it, you're don't, you, there's no growth left in it, then you sell out. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs I see, they, they get in this game down where like, they start a business, they sell a business, they start a business, they sell a business. And it's like, they never really, in my experience, have the same level of fulfillment doing that as they do in the actual process of like building and growing the business, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. But each of us also have like, within our wheelhouse, whatever you want to call the ability to grow a business to certain levels. Some people need it sort of already started and then have this vision where they could buy it from somebody and scale it, right? Absolutely. But they don't like the creation process. And other people, I think myself included, is like the creation process then up to a certain level. It's like, I got it. I can do this and then sell it off to somebody with that vision to take it somewhere. So we all find our parts within sort of the ecosystem of entrepreneurship, I think. Definitely, for sure. So, yeah, everyone's got their own skills. That's a great point. And yeah, like you said, I mean, some people are just great at starting. Some people are great at taking an existing business and, and growing it and scaling it. And so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And something you should definitely take into account is, you know, where are, where are your strengths in business and, and what do you really enjoy doing? Because, you know, if you love starting it and you can't stand scaling it, then maybe that's the best model for you is to start businesses and sell them. Absolutely. Yeah, to me, the, the only reason why, like philosophically, the only reason why you would ever sell a business is because you don't see that vision for the future anymore. So you're selling it at 24 months or 36 months or 48 months. You're getting paid in advance for it, but you don't see where it could go past there. And the only reason why you would buy it at that point is because you see this huge vision in front of it. To me, that's the only reason why a business would ever change hands is that vision stopped. Like you've, that's where you saw it ending. And the next person, that's where they see it beginning. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Yeah. So so I guess I'm kind of in a different camp in, in terms of you know, I'm, I'm always trying to look towards the future. Like what's the vision? What's the next step? And it's, it's not selling. Right? Exactly. It's like, it's like, how do we grow this? How do we keep expanding? How do we keep growing? Cause to me, that's the fun of business is the growth. That, that's what I love about it. Exactly. And so this idea of like this sort of framework you have for deciding on which projects to work on next, the problem with, I mean, it's an awesome framework, but I'm sure things still don't work out perfectly the way they should. So what happens with, I know you're super into iteration, but what happens when the iterative process sort of reaches its end and it's just like, this is just a bad idea. This was not going to ever work. How do you sort of deal with that with your team? Like, how do you deal with sort of that failure and moving forward? That's a good question. So I think there's, there's a couple things. So first of all, it, sometimes what looks like failure is actually just success, but it hasn't, hasn't panned out yet, Right. So I think a lot of people give up too soon, like that mine analogy. It's like, you know, you dig a hundred feet in the ground and you know, that gold vein is just 10 more feet, but you give up before the last 10 feet. Right. I think that happens a ton in business, but uh, at the same time, what also happens very often is that 
you do start something and it's just a complete bust and you're just digging, 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 there's nothing there. And so I tried to get really clear on that. Okay, like, is this, if we keep doing this, even though it's not working today, will it work in the future, right? Like, is this, is there a promise here or are we really just, you know, just digging and digging the dirt essentially, right? So I try to kind of reflect on that and get advice from my team on that and, and other people, other experts, you know, coaches, investors, you know, people who have experience who can tell me honestly, like, you know, either this is a good idea or it's not. And so a lot of times what will happen is, yeah, it's like, it's a great idea. We should keep doing it. It's not, maybe not be profitable right now, but it will be in the future. Right. Other times it's just this, this you know, clearly it's not going to work. And so that's when we just wrap it up. We just, you know, we kind of have this like an autopsy, right? So we, <laughs> so we go back and, and we'll talk with the team and whoever's involved in that project and say, Hey, like, you know, this isn't going to work. You know, here's what we learned. Uh, here's the mistakes we made, you know, here's like the value we got out of this. So maybe even though we never made a profit on this, you know, these are the lessons we got. These are the context, the resources we got. So it was still a good thing for us and, and it taught us what not to do. And so now we're going to get focused and free up our time to work on something else, something more important. I love it. I love it. You, you definitely have that, uh, entrepreneurial sort of mindset, like failure just doesn't even hardly come into it. It's just, you just haven't dug far enough yet, man. <laughs> yeah. So failure just 10 I mean, feet away. Absolutely. Yeah. Like failure doesn't mean anything. Like it's, it's totally in your mind. Right. So I'm, I've gotten really big recently into mindfulness training and Michael Singer, if you've never heard of him, he's got some great books and a great, amazing YouTube video. We can link in the show notes about mindfulness training. Essentially it's like, it's just letting go of all the, these thoughts, beliefs, feelings, emotions, right? A lot of people like we get stuck. Like I think the biggest issue entrepreneurs have is they get stuck in their emotions and think, Oh, it didn't work. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. This business you know, is never going to work. I'm never going to be successful. Right? Like all this stuff that goes through your head. And if you hold on to that, it's just, it's like a self-fulfilling for prophecy. Right? And so I think what you have to do is you have to be able to let go of the emotion around failure. So you can just learn from it because all it is, is feedback from the world. Like there is no failure in our universe, mm -hmm. right? It's just, it's totally a concept of the human mind. And if you can step back from that concept and just look at the actual facts, like what actually happened in the situation, that's where the gold is, right? Like the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. And when you can look at those quote unquote failures, those things that, that happened and learn from them, that's when you're going to have the lessons that will get you to your success, right? Like thinking grow, which he talks about Napoleon Hill talks about, you know, for every failure is the seed of, you know, an equal or greater opportunity. And it's absolutely true, but you have to have that mindset where you can disconnect from that emotion and actually learn from what actually happened rather than just, you know, getting stuck in your mind, getting stuck in your thoughts, because that's how you will just get stuck and never move forward. Very well said. Very well said. So this has been an absolute blast, Tom. I want to wrap up on one final question, which ties in really well to this sort of mindfulness. And you probably already do this sort of activity because of the mindfulness training you're doing. But it's this idea I'm working with calling the entrepreneurial gap. It's this gap that I think we live in as entrepreneurs, as dreamers. We're always projecting our own successes into the future, meaning that in one month when you hit that revenue goal, in six months when you hit whatever metric you've set for yourself, that's when you'll see yourself as successful. Yet we both know that right before, seconds before you hit that goal, you're going to set five or 10 bigger ones into the future, which I believe we have to do uh, to always push ourselves forward. But we often end up in this gap that from the outside, we look really successful with the things we're accomplishing, but to ourselves, it's always in the future, which we never seem to ever get to. So I would like it if you could right now stop and look behind you. The highs, the lows, the wins and the losses. You've been at this game a long time since your teens when you started your first business. And I would like to know how you feel about the whole journey up until today. Hmm. I mean, it's like, it's like the best thing I've ever done with my life. I mean, it's like the best decision I ever made. It was like each decision when I was like, I'm going to start this business, right? I'm going to, I'm going to create this project. I'm going to help people. I'm going to make a difference. I think that for me is what entrepreneurship is all about. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've had so much like failure and mistakes and, and lessons I've learned and all the emotions I've gone through and the pain and the struggle and the challenge and the success. I mean, it's been amazing, right? I mean, I can't imagine, you know, doing anything else with my life. Like when I look back, like, I don't regret a moment of it. I don't regret, I mean, I absolutely wish, you know, there are times when I had said, you know, this business is never going to work, you know, sooner rather than later. Right. And, and just move on to something new. But I mean, it has honestly, it's like the best decision I've ever made in my life. Like, I can't imagine what my life would be like if I hadn't become an entrepreneur. 
Uh, and I think that's something that you like people who aren't entrepreneurs yet, like they don't, they don't understand it. Like they don't understand how being an entrepreneur, it changes every area of your life. It changes everything from your relationships, your health, your consciousness, your spirituality, like everything in your life is changed when you become an entrepreneur, because when you become an entrepreneur, you say, Hey, like I'm, I'm now in control of my life. I'm in control of the results I get. I'm in control of my future. I'm in control of the world, right? Like, like as an entrepreneur, you, you change the world, you change, you create jobs, you create opportunities, you help customers solve problems. I mean, like to me, it's like, there's, there's nothing more spiritual than being an entrepreneur because you're, you're making the world a better place if you're doing good business and you're doing business well. And so when I look back, I'm just incredibly like in awe of the journey and grateful for everything, you know, all the struggles and the challenges and the success. I love it. Beautiful answer, man. Beautiful answer. So we've got to talk about your business sort of in passing. Could you know specifically, Tom, tell the listener where they can track you down online to ask you some more questions and where they can find your business online? Yeah, absolutely. So you can check us out at tckpublishing.com. And we are an independent publisher. We specialize in helping authors create their brand and platform so they can earn a full-time income or more from royalties. I also have a free video training course for anyone who's interested in learning how to actually write and publish their first book. That's at ebookpublishingschool.com. And then I also have the podcast show. So every single week we interview a best-selling author to find out what's working right now in their business to grow their sales and grow their income. And that's at publishingprofitspodcast.com. And if you guys have any questions or anything I can do to help you, I mean, feel free to reach out to me personally at tckpublishing.com. You'll see the contact form and I'll answer any questions you guys send personally. Awesome. Publishingprofitspodcast.com. I was a guest on the show or am going to be. Absolutely. In like four weeks yeah. from today, but okay. it'll probably be live by the time this is live. Right. Perfect. We'll get a link to that. tckpublishing.com and ebookpublishingschool.com. I'll link to all that in the show notes for you. Also, some books were mentioned. Uh, Work the System by Sam Carpenter a video series, mindfulness training on YouTube by Michael Singer and think and grow rich. I'll get links to all those in the show notes so you can track them down easily as well. Tom, once again, man, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thanks for being so open and please just keep doing what you're doing, man. It's awesome and inspiring to watch. Thank you, John. Likewise, I really appreciate all the great work you're doing. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for sharing so openly. I really, really appreciate it. I hope that you out there listening got as much out of that conversation as I did. Tom's, Tom's got a, I like his philosophical and that contemplative sort of mindset. I think it's really, I think it's valuable as an entrepreneur and as a human. But I also think that entrepreneurship and just being a good human are kind of one and the same. It's, it's a creative endeavor. I think, I think creativity and pushing forth in those ways is, I think it's helpful to becoming a better version of one's self. So it's interesting to go through this conversation with Tom. And then it's another whole thing to get to go back and listen to it separately, like you got to. So I went back and I listened and I went back again. And then I went back again. That final time that I went through, there was one thing that Tom said that was so very, very clear to me. It was that one thing. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. I try to always have redundancy in my business so that I always have multiple contractors available. So it doesn't mean I'm paying them regularly. It doesn't mean I'm working with them regularly, but I know who they are. I've built these relationships up ahead of time so that if my web designer does disappear in the middle of nowhere, I can find someone else to replace them. And I also have those you know, standard operating procedures or SOPs, whatever you want to call them, just those written guidelines of, of here's how you do the work. And that's the hack. Tom, Tom, Tom. I love this. This is, this is good. The, re- the idea of having redundancy in your business. I mean, think of it like a chain, right? What do we say always? The, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. I've seen so many people build businesses and have this one crucial person, whether that's like an editor, a writer, a coder, a designer, a customer support person, anything and not having those SOPs, the standard operating procedures written around the person's job, but then also having only one person in that place. And so I really like how Tom says, like, I don't pay these people, but I do have them in place. And I don't just have one. I always have somebody else there uh, because you can't be dependent on other people because they don't value your business the way you ever will. 
And this idea of having this redundancy for this purpose is extremely smart and valuable. And SOPs, I mean, SOPs are a huge thing. You can look them up, how to write them. There's no trick to them. It's literally writing out sort of point form what, how you do every single task in your business. Put it into a Google Doc so it's kind of a living, breathing document that can be edited at all times. Nothing fancy. Nothing doesn't cost you any money to do. It just takes the time. But these are the things that make your business more stable and also more valuable to you, yourself, your customers, and also to put to a potential buyer if you do want to sell it at some point. Tom, thank you so much. All right, hacktheentrepreneur.com is the website. Head over there, get onto the email list. I would love to have you and uh, check out the notes. We got some interesting books for Tom on Tom's show notes here. Think and Grow Rich, we talked about, we talked about that mindfulness YouTube videos. Work the system, which is really about processes and SOPs in your business. It's a great sort of primer on it and it'll really get you going. So I'll link to that as well, as well as the websites to track Tom himself down. So head over to Hack the Entrepreneur and uh, yeah, those, those links will be waiting for you when you get there. <laughs> All right. It's been fun. Thank you so much for stopping by. I really, truly appreciate it. And please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur. <laughs>